muscles are made up of thousands upon thousands of individual muscle fibres. And all of these muscle fibres are grouped into motor units. These motor units are arranged in order of recruitment threshold. So low threshold motor units are recruited first, so their muscle fibres get activated first. And high threshold motor units are recruited last, and so their muscle fibres are activated last. Um, but the number of muscle fibres differs between the motor units. So low threshold motor units only control a small number of muscle fibres, maybe 10 or 20 fibres each, whereas the high threshold motor units will control maybe a couple of thousand muscle fibres each. So when we're trying to achieve hypertrophy, what we want to do is make sure that the high threshold motor units are recruited, because otherwise the growth of muscle fibres won't be very large, because the high threshold motor units are those that control the vast majority of the muscle fibres in the muscle. Additionally, the muscle fibres of low threshold motor units aren't actually very responsive to the strength training stimulus. And this might be because they have quite a high training status compared to the muscle fibres of the high threshold motor units because they're used in every activity that we do on a daily basis. And so they've already reached their maximum possible capacity uh, for size um, because of the uh, previous loading that they've had uh, over the course of our lives. And therefore it's very important that during strength training we achieve the recruitment of the high threshold motor units and activate their muscle fibres because those are the ones that are going to grow. And in typical bodybuilding training this is done by increasing the fatigue throughout a set and that's commonly called training to failure or close to failure. And what we're actually doing when we train to failure is we're increasing the level of fatigue that occurs in both the central nervous system and inside the muscle. And we can call these central fatigue and peripheral fatigue to refer to the two different types of fatigue that affect our ability to produce force during any given muscular contraction. Peripheral fatigue is a reduction in the force producing ability of individual muscle fibres because of changes that occur inside the muscle fibres themselves. During normal strength training, peripheral fatigue is quite closely linked to the accumulation of certain metabolites. Now, these metabolites are produced as a result of reactions that supply energy to the actin myosin crossbridge cycle, which is what produces force inside the muscle fiber. As these metabolites accumulate, they start to inhibit the reactions that take place to provide energy to the muscle fiber, and therefore the amount of force that the actin myosin crossbridge can produce becomes smaller. However, this only occurs because it's the concentric phase that's the limiting factor during normal strength training. If we perform eccentric only strength training, uh, where there's no concentric phase at all, then because eccentric contractions are so much more efficient than concentric contractions, and they don't require as much energy to produce a given level of force, then the supply of energy into the crossbridge cycle is much less of a limiting factor than it was in a concentric contraction. And so fatigue builds up in different ways and not as a result necessarily of the accumulation of metabolites. So ultimately what we're saying here is that peripheral fatigue can occur with or without the accumulation of metabolites. Now during normal strength training it often does, almost always does occur in conjunction with the accumulation of metabolites, but the metabolites aren't necessary in order for fatigue to occur peripheral fatigue to occur inside the muscle fibers. That can occur in other, through other methods depending on the contraction type. Importantly, whenever peripheral fatigue occurs, so whenever there is a reduction in the force producing ability of individual muscle fibers because of changes inside the muscle fibers themselves, then the central nervous system compensates um, by increasing the level of motor unit recruitment. In other words, it detects that the muscle fibres that were working previously have stopped producing quite as much force and so it recruits extra motor units and brings other muscle fibres into play to compensate. Now importantly, this can occur with or without 
the accumulation of metabolites. We don't need metabolites in order to produce peripheral fatigue, and we don't need metabolites in order to produce an increase in motor unit recruitment. All that we need is peripheral fatigue to occur. So as peripheral fatigue occurs, there is an increase in motor unit recruitment, and that uh, increase in motor unit recruitment follows the size principle. So initially, low threshold motor units were recruited, and as fatigue uh, builds up inside the muscle, uh, then um, additional motor units are recruited in accordance with the size principle and eventually, hopefully, we end up with most of the high threshold motor units being recruited as well. Now, because peripheral fatigue naturally leads to an increase in motor unit recruitment levels, some people have claimed that if we train to failure, which involves high levels of peripheral fatigue, then we will achieve full motor unit recruitment regardless of anything else that's going on. And this probably isn't true. The reason it's not true is because of central fatigue. And central fatigue is very simply where the central nervous system downregulates the level of motor unit recruitment during a given fatigue and contraction in order to reduce the amount of force that we're producing. And this occurs most commonly in aerobic exercise, but it also occurs and has been recorded during strength training as well. And to the extent that central fatigue is present, we won't reach full motor unit recruitment, even though we reach muscular failure. It's actually quite an unfortunate term, because when we say muscular failure, we think that the muscle has achieved some state of failure. And actually, it's task failure, because the failure comes from both central and peripheral mechanisms. So central fatigue builds up in much the same way as peripheral fatigue and it decays after the end of each set in much the same way as peripheral fatigue. So when we think about central fatigue, we can use it to explain quite a lot of the results that we've observed in the strength training literature that otherwise don't make a lot of sense. So for example, when we perform exercises in a given order, we tend to find that the exercises that we do first in a workout tend to produce the most muscle growth of the particular muscles or regions of the muscle that are worked by those exercises and the exercises that we do later on in the workout tend not to produce quite as uh, good effect. So central fatigue is, is a pretty good candidate to explain why that happens. So as we progress through the workout and central fatigue starts to build up, the exercises that we perform last, even if we train to muscular failure, probably aren't recruiting quite as many of the high threshold motor units as the exercises that we did first. Similarly, if we train with short rest periods, then essentially each set that we do later on in the sequence of sets is being commenced at a state of central fatigue that's higher than it would be if we'd taken a longer rest. So the shorter rests we take, the more central fatigue is present, and the less likely it is that we're going to recruit high threshold motor units. So how can we reduce the amount of central fatigue that we experience in any given workout. Well, obviously, we can take longer rests because short rests mean that we start a set before central fatigue has dissipated from the previous one. However, when it comes to exercise order, we probably have a number of exercises that we want to do and some of them have to go at the end of the workout. So it's quite difficult to um, manipulate exercise order um, in order to change the amount of central fatigue that we're exposed to. However, there is a possibility that we could manipulate exercise order in a beneficial way because the amount of central fatigue that we experience is directly related to the amount of muscle mass that's involved in performing the exercise. So if we perform a multi-joint exercise that involves more central fatigue than a single joint exercise, and if we perform a two limb variation of an exercise, then that will involve more central fatigue than a single limb variation of the same exercise. So as we progress through a workout, we could minimize the amount of central fatigue that we're experiencing by switching from multi-joint exercises to single joint exercises. And perhaps even by the time we get to the end of the workout, we could be switching to single limb, single joint exercises. And so thereby minimize the amount of central fatigue that's occurring, despite the fact that central fatigue probably has built up over the course of the whole workout.